Thank you for joining me today for the session on the Lister Barlows as an early rainbow family. A bit of a provocative title, I must admit, as we all know of the ambivalence or even reluctance um, and list a display towards any kind of commitment towards Maria Barlow. And uh, we can probably imagine Anne shuddering at the thought of being referred to as a Lister Barlow. But as we are also unfortunately aware of, families do not necessarily have to be happy to be considered families and historical phenomena do not need to be an enduring success to be studied. As a quick introduction, my name is Jan Kraus. I'm a historian based in Switzerland and I work as a lecturer at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. My dissertation on um, Anne's first journey through Switzerland is at the University of Fribourg. And so I'm mostly occupied with the year 1827 and the surrounding time of preparation and um, after the journey, how all of this impacted Anne's life. In the short time we have today, I'd like to present to you some of the observations I have gathered on this subject when I started asking myself, while reading about the planning and execution of the journey through Switzerland, Italy, Germany, and France, rather lightheartedly to begin with, whether Anne, Maria, and Jane could be considered a queer family in some way. As always, when doing historical research, there's three things we have to do. Uh, we need to collect, sort, and explore the source material at hand, contextualize what we find both within Lister's life and within its broader historical context, and then evaluate the theoretical and methodological tools we have to make meaning of our observations. So let's start off with the terminology that you see right in front of you. The term rainbow family has been used to refer to queer families, especially in German for the last at least two decades after being established at a conference concerning itself with queer rights by the pioneer Lila Lehnemann. It is sometimes said to have been inspired by Josephine Baker, the dancer and singer who created her own um, family of children she adopted from all over the world with different ethnicities, religious backgrounds, um, and she called that the rainbow tribe. Although there might not be a direct correlation, just having the rainbow flag and the concept of family, it just seems like several sources might have come up with that independently. So a common understanding of a rainbow family defines it at, as at least one person who identifies as queer in some way, taking on parental duties for at least one child. So this could mean a lesbian couple adopting children, a transmasculine single parent with a biological child, uh, a family with more than two parents who might all be in relationship with each other, a family where one parent is intersex or all kinds of other different options. Now, within historical research, there's an ongoing debate about applying anachronistic terminology. So can we call a person queer or homosexual who lived centuries before these terms were even invented? And if we are to follow that logic, we can't only apply to terminology concerning queerness. We'd also have to ask, can we refer to a woman, her child and her new partner in early 19th century Paris as, for example, a blended family or a step family or a patchwork family, as these expressions are just as anachronistic as saying rainbow family, for that matter. We might be tempted to then say, oh, let's use step family, as this is such an old word and concept, like the concept of stepmother, stepchild dates around to maybe even the ninth century, um, which also means it comes with a lot of cultural baggage and connotations we'd have to unpack if we were to use it in a scientific way. And even so, it still probably wouldn't have been a term that Anne or Maria would have used for their social constellation. And all of this is just before we look at the historical implications of the word family itself, since family is neither ahistorical or transhistorical with or without the added rainbow. By this, I mean, for somebody like Anne Lister, speaking in an early 19th century context, family could refer to one's ancestry, like comparing the pedigree and good breeding of an individual so all the listers that came before, maybe. Or it could encompass the members of the household back at Shipton in almost like this ancient Roman sense that everyone who lives and works around the house is the family. Or it could extend to broader concepts of kinship that include all of those you are connected to through marriage as well. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, I want to introduce you to a very German concept, a lovely expression in German academia called etwas unselbstverständlich machen, 
which basically means to remove the notion that something is self-evident because treating it as universal or unquestionable keeps us from seeing it for what it really is, which usually means it's something man-made, historically grown and subject to change. Therefore, I'd argue using a clearly and almost irritatingly modern term like rainbow family might do more to startle us into remembering that our idea of family is not the one shared by somebody 200 years ago than simply rejecting it and using family as a neutral or universal concept. Exploring the specific language used by one source is valuable in and of itself, something we do a lot in the list of studies. But limiting our own analytical language to the source's idiom limits our scope of discovery and understanding. A person does not need to know the word intersex to be intersex. And over millennia, people have discovered, reinvented gay, lesbian, queer love and desire. They have explored trans identities without ever having access to the vocabulary we have now. And while all this terminology is just an approximation to the lived realities of these people, it serves to make connections and understand shared experiences across time and space. And this makes it useful for us scientifically and also politically. And in many areas of the list of studies, we already adhere to this principle. So we are quite used by now to, um, of, to thinking of Anne taking the sacrament with her partner as a wedding and what follows as a marriage. Um, we haven't quite established the to conceptualize Anne's relationship to Maria Jane as a family, but we could try to do that, which is especially interesting when we read in a letter from December 1828 that Maria and Anne seem to have taken the sacrament together the year before, supporting the idea that they somehow planned a life together, that Anne might have, you know, known this in the context of her considering this a marriage and maybe even considered co-parenting in some way. So what will we see if we attempt to treat them as a rainbow family? We are looking at two queer individuals, Anna and Maria, who were intimately involved with each other, entertaining notions of creating a life together, including traveling together, discussing cohabitation. One of them has a child. One has, at that moment, an ailing aunt, both of which are heavily involved in the everyday lives of the other. Um, and frequently spends time alone with Jane. They go for walks, they look at churches. Jane and Maria spend time with Aunt Lister without Anne regularly. And for all intents and purposes, they are acting like we'd expect a family that is queer to act, especially with a step-parent component. And I'd like to illustrate this point um, with a few passages organized by topic. If we could go to the next slide, we will start with something uh, fun, jealousy. So as David Glover, uh, Glover has already pointed out at this summit, in 2021, Jane repeatedly showed jealousy towards Anne in the beginning of Anne and Maria's relationship in 1824 and 25. So Anne notices that Jane doesn't really appreciate sharing her mother's attention, addresses this with her. Um, and we can see that she's even communicating the expectation that Jane will behave friendly towards her. Uh, upon Anne's return to Paris in 1826, so she has left to gone back to England for a while, now she's back. It seems more like Maria is jealous of Jane, Jane getting attention from anyone, not just Anne, and tries to compete with her daughter. Um, there's a scene about a dancing master who compliments Maria. Uh, Anne comments on that as well, like this, this odd competitive moment we have. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Maria brings up Jane's future and reputation as a reason for Anne to have a respectable relationship and not be Anne's mistress compared to Mariana, who has more of the wife status in this kind of argument. And Anne and Maria consider Jane's future options together. That is a recurring topic. So uh, they talk about edu her education. They talk about um, to bring whether to bring her to Edinburgh or to London. And jealousy also, yeah, it comes up in all these different constellations, former partners, child, mother competition. So we see this come up again and again. On the next slide, we see this whole step-parent dynamic taking on um, some other dimensions as well. So Jane is increasingly annoyed with her mother for being so sentimental and for being weak in respect to Anne. So she's like, oh, it's, you know, there's a problem of Maria keeping Anne's old slippers and not giving them away. Um, on the other hand, we also see very, a lot of positive interactions, like Anne gets Jane's gifts regularly. She gives her 
um, sweets on the day of Maria's birthday. So, you know, Jane isn't jealous or she gets her um, roses for her confirmation, books of all sorts when she buys books for herself and diligently records Jane's health, practices French with her and um, seems to be genuinely moved by Jane's joy about the travel plans they make together. But she also uses these travel plans um, to defend her travels to Mariana by saying, oh, you know, it's for the child. It's really important for Jane. I'm never alone with Maria, that kind of thing. So it's a pretext when talking to Mariana. But in her diary, she's also like, oh, Jane seems really elated about this. She seems to be really looking forward to traveling together. So uh, there are always these this dual aspects to all of this. At other times, um, Anne is quite annoyed with Jane. So... She comments on her childish behavior, clinging to her mother, her physical limitations when traveling, not being able to walk all day, and also remarks that in the end, um, she would rather Jane wasn't there. But all these things are pretty ambivalent and they go back and forth. This is one of these times where Anne sometimes uses Jane as an excuse as not to be intimate with Maria, but also doesn't want to spend time with her. So it's, it keeps being ambivalent in that way, which then leads us to the question of, what does Jane actually know about the queerness of the relationship, about the sexuality? And we have the next slide to um, look at this in more detail. So when it comes to gender perception and sex and queerness in general, there is no, there's not a general taboo around being affectionate around each other. So Anne, for example, sees no problem with having her legs across Maria's lap while Jane is present. Uh, they do worry about Jane witnessing them being in bed when they travel together, especially when they share a room. So they take some precautions, such as pinning the curtains together, trying to keep their voices down, but they don't abstain from physical intimacy. Uh, the only reason they do that is because Anne is increasingly annoyed with Maria and tries to get out of these situations. But um, especially in one moment where Anne and Maria leave the salon and go to the bedroom together, Anne notes the girl must wonder a little about their relationship. And Jane is not as unaware as the grown-ups might think or maybe even hope. In a heated argument about uh, deciding who gets to occupy which room in Italy, Jane unilaterally chooses the single room, forcing Anne and Maria to bunk up together and remarking that Anne used to fight to stay with her mother and now she seems to fight to stay away from her, which is a very pointed remark. Uh, and that in turn makes Anne angry, who then complains to Maria why a lady of 16 years should talk to a grown-up that way, basically. But also she has to admit they did fight in front of her. So that's what you get, basically. But this sexuality talk is not only connected to queerness. Um, there's also this, uh, not in the sense of, oh, being discovered. There's also these conversations about gender, especially when they're fighting. Maria tends to bring up that she, she compares Anne to men, especially her former husband. She comments on Anne's potential fertility, like, oh, if you were a man or if you had a penis and I didn't know when I met you what kind of genitalia you had, she brings that up a lot. So there, there is this sense of, oh, what if you I were to treat you like a man? And that's just within the, the relationship between these three. There's also the issue of going outside, like being perceived by society. Um, if they are um, perceived in public, sometimes Anne's appearance uh, attracts attention, usually connected to her clothing, um, if she wears heavy boots or caps that are only worn by men. And Maria, who is very much not, she's not critical of Anne in the sense that Mariana often is, but there are still situations that lead to conflict. When they visit Colmar, for example, people keep staring at Anne and that makes Jane nervous. And perceiving that nervousness wants to go without them, says, oh, you walk along, I'll go somewhere else. Maria doesn't want to do that. She wants to stick with Anne. And in the end, Anne still leaves to walk alone and has two more of these encounters where she gets mistaken for a man. There are also other uh, sources of conflicts. For example, Jane has negative opinions on Tip. She considers Tip very vulgar. Uh, and Jane and Maria make a comment that Aunt Lister might be losing her faculties at some point during her illness, which Anne also doesn't like. And all of this is just without going into detail about the ongoing and admittedly justified jealousy of 
Maria towards Mariana and Sybil as well at that point. And Anne's mounting dislike and repulsion towards Maria, which we can't go in depth uh, about today. But there are these years, these a good four constant years where Anne is in the Barlow's lives. And after coming back from the travels, she breaks it off basically and leaves again. But the letters continue for a while. So in the end, the relationship and therefore this potential family unit didn't survive the intense proximity of the months spent together traveling. Um, that is not to say our attempt at understanding and learning something new by following this framework also failed. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, we have learned that Anne and Maria could envision a life together. They could talk about it. They might have kept living it if things had been different. So it was real enough to them to reject the idea in the end, or at least to Anne to say no and to remove herself from this situation. And this decision doesn't seem to be motivated by uh, the idea or the lack of of the concreteness. So it was mostly personal reasons and preferences from Anne's side and not because the concept of building a life with this woman and her child was unthinkable. If it had been unthinkable, they wouldn't have been fighting about it so much. And that in itself shows us that there's a contemporary understanding of queer families in some way, even if that is not how they thought of it. And even if we have no idea how they got to that point in the first place. It also allows us to create a new context to compare it to by acknowledging this as an attempt at family life and taking it seriously, we can use this to take up space in the field of family studies. We can say we can compare this to other family systems at the time. So maybe we can't, can't find queer families at that time, but we could find a potential stepfather reflecting on him marrying a widow with a child and how he got, got along with that child. We might find probably similar worries about jealousy, respectability, or being affectionate and intimate around the child. And that could help us see what we what are the conventions of the time and what is specific to this situation. As it has already been said today in the panel on Bridging the Gap, this is one of the most important tasks we have to do is we want to draw lists of studies out of the isolation and bring it in context with broader research and broader discussions. If we can go to the next slide, I have two quotes that I'd like to show you before I draw my conclusions. The first one describes the goals we might have when trying to bring queerness into scientific work. We must envision a dual mandate for queer methods to outline the conditions of queer world making and to clarify but not overdetermine the conditions that make life livable. This vision of what queer methods could be feels to me like it's describing Anne Wister's way of living exceptionally well, for we are constantly trying to understand how Anne managed to envision and create a life that was as authentic as it could be without giving up respectability and safety out of what was available to her and how we try to follow along without forcing our own interpretations onto the material. The other quote on the next slide um, consider, concerns itself with failure. Failing is something queers do, says Jack Halberstam, and have always done exceptionally well. For queers, failure can be a style or a way of life, and it can stand in contrast to the grim scenarios of success that depend upon trying and trying again. Just going to skip a part to get the, to the juicy bit. Perhaps most obviously failure allows us to escape the punishing norms that discipline behavior and manage human development with the goal of delivering us from unruly childhood to orderly and predictable adulthoods. And there is something bittersweet in framing failure as something queer, uh, but we can't deny that it rings true in some sense. Didn't so many plans of Anne's fail? Aren't we just as fascinated to see and speculate about the hypothetical lives shared with Eliza Rain or Mariana or Sybil, or even about more and happier years with Anne Walker? And it's also true about the gender expression. Wherever Anne goes, the clothes, the mannerism, the physical attributes are a source of irritation. She has in some way failed to be integrated into the norm and therefore has to deal with the consequences of this any day. And we can learn something from this irritation and subversiveness in our studies. If we could go to the next slide, I'd like to draw my conclusions. Um, oh, the actually, let's go to the one after that right away. Thank you. So if we want to research rainbow families in historical periods in any useful way, we cannot expect to find nuclear families that happen to be queer like we might do nowadays. 
we need to look for attempts at integrating queerness into the current concepts of families and kinship of the places and periods we are studying. This should also mean developing a definition of queer families or rainbow families that is not a simple derivative of nuclear families and therefore not only defined by the queer identity of one parent, but on the other hand, by any member of the family that leads to the familial system adjusting to make space for its queerness. So I would argue the queering of Anne's family structure isn't uh, her exploring cohabitation with a partner and her child and not even her relatives being accepting towards these romantic relationships. So I think it starts with the conflict surrounding Anne's gender presentation in her youth that then morph into some kind of acceptance of her family. It involves the close personal ties that Anne's family members have with other queer people like Tip, Norcliffe or so many others. It involves Anne's relatives accepting her, becoming the heir to Shipton and all these meaningful ways of integrating Anne's queerness into their own family dynamic in a material and real way. And on the next slide, I think all of these observations bring us back to the questions which have drawn us to the archives in the first place when we search for queer ancestors. The questions that we have such as, how have queer people throughout history envisioned their lives? How did they try to carve out some space for themselves? Who helped them and who made room for them? And yes, coming back to failure and why and how did they fail so we can take something away from this. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm now gonna take a look at the questions that you might have um, asked or the comments you might have made. And da, da, da. What do we have here? Ah, we have a question about whether Anne Lister has been taking on the role of a female husband, which is, you know, the female husband is is like a, this this role in, in queer studies when two women or two people we consider to be women live together and then one takes on the social role of, of, of the husband in some respects, sometimes emotionally, sometimes even depending on the culture legally or at least economically. There is some research on Anne doing exactly that. I think one of the problems with Anne or one of the beautiful things is that she does not see herself like somebody else. You know, she is not, she's not looking for equals. Even when talking to somebody like Tip, who is very similar to her in masculinity, she rejects that similarity and saying like, oh, I've been compared to something, but I don't like this. So she sometimes remarks when Maria brings up her first husband, she she says something like, oh, it's it, this is interesting or it's, it's, it's pleasing to me that she compares me to him because she cares about the respectability of marriage. She cares about the respectability in society, but I think she's more measuring herself in that sense towards the straight model of respectability. So I don't think she's necessarily influenced by a female husband system and more like, oh, if I were to have this position, this is what I would have to do to be respectable. Um, then there's also a question about how I got into this research topic. Um, well, I started with with the travels through Switzerland because it just it it tickled me to be fair that she was traveling through all these places that I know and that are so these tiny villages. She has reached places that nobody knows about, and I'm like, why, why, why are you here? And then I asked myself, how could they, how did they know how to exist in a foreign country? How did they know what was safe to do, what was okay to do, what was um, suspicious or not suspicious? Because they discuss, oh, in Italy, we can't do this, or here it's okay to do this because it's so provincial as well. Switzerland is very provincial at that time. And then just Jane kept popping up. Jane just kept being there and engaging with them. And she's not just decoration. You know, this is a real human who is who's shaped the travels and especially in the travel preparation. If you look at that time, you can just see Jane being such a big part of why they went there. Like there are all these moments when Anne wants to call off the travels for herself, where she's like, oh, I don't think I should go. My aunt is so sick. And then she comes home to Maria and Jane and says, oh, they've been talking about these travels and they're so excited. And it's just moments like that, or just being frustrated by Jane's inability to hike, which seems like the kind of fight every family has on a holiday. And that's just what drew me into this topic. But there's so much more about this to discover. So I've just looked at this tiny fraction. 
of it all. Um, did I overlook anything? I don't know. Yes, chosen family. That's a good point. I did want to talk about that as well, but we don't have much term for that. So when it comes to chosen family, we should also then talk about the whole network. So how important is tip for this? How important, especially for the travel plans, you can just see and drawing on all of these um, different kinds of resources. And there's not a clear boundary between who is a friend and who's family in that sense, you know, because Tip is somebody you can go to to borrow money, for example. This is a very close relationship. And there are people that it's not okay to go to, to ask for money because the respectability might be in question in some way. But this is um, just one of the aspects where we had to... Oh, great. So I can, I can talk for more than I thought. That's perfect. Um, so... If we look at creating our family, I think we should also talk about dissolving these boundaries between networks of friendship and networks of, of relation, because if we accept that taking the sacrament is a marriage, then all these ties that are, might be informal in some legal sense, we must take them seriously and, you know, at face value and then say, okay, who are the people who do what families do? So who, who support um, in child raising, for example, who support in financing each other, who take care of each other in illness. So going about the going along the signs of practices, what is it that families are supposed to do in a certain time and how do they represent each other and their own structure towards um, towards the public and then see where can we find queer people in these networks. Uh, uh, there's a question where we can possibly find your work. I would like to know that as well. That is very fascinating. Where can I find it? So I have not actually published anything on Enlister as of yet. So because I'm going to integrate this into my dissertation, but I'm planning on publishing parts of this. So I would like to find a good vessel for this. Um, I think the best thing you can do is just to stay in contact with me in some way on uh, on Twitter or Instagram or email. I have... Actually, I had a last slide on that, but you can just, I'll just put my username in the chat and then you can just find me anywhere, really. Um, that's my username for Instagram and Twitter. And I would love to have some contact with all of you, or you can write me emails at my work address. Um, are there any other thoughts or comments you had on this? Oh, there was a failure thing. Failure versus choice not to continue. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think failure has to be in a sense of our oh, personal failure. Like it's not a character flaw. But I think we can sometimes see this model didn't work. This approach didn't work. So I have to give it up, and it it's not a success. And I don't think there is a deliberate choice in letting something fail or not not continuing. But there are also some things that are not in in people's control. Like it's not, Anne can't control the fact that even if she were to dress more ladylike, there would be some source of irritation because we learn from the diaries. There's also some physical attributes. It's not just it's not just the clothes. It's also the mannerisms. It's also her her body that gets scrutinized in that way, and even if she tries to make a relationship work, there might be factors outside of her control. So, okay, Mariana's husband didn't die, shucks. And that failed, the plan that she made failed. You know, the plan that they had to grow all together as these respectable ladies where one of them is a widow, that didn't work out because of the external factors. And I think dealing with these, with these problems that they have and these frustrations is something we should do because the survival element and this is also very strong how do you deal with obstacles how do you deal with these frustrations without letting it get you down and in that sense i think failure can be kind of a liberating concept in some way if we just look at it as okay if the plan didn't work if the model didn't work if the approach didn't work maybe it's not my fault maybe it's the approach or the model that is flawed in some sense Uh, I think I've seen all the comments, unless somebody has anything to add. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, society is definitely flawed. I mean, that much that much we can agree on. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for your attention and sorry for the delay in the beginning. I'm glad we got through it all and had some time to chat. And yeah, I hope we all enjoy the rest of the of the day.